guys, it's Kaylin. I am back with another podcast. I have not recorded one for quite a little while, and there are a few reasons for that. Uh, one of the main reasons, I would say, is that I have to turn my air conditioning off in order to record, and if you've been following anything about my health journey, you would know that I had a pretty devastating few weeks here with a lot of complications from the heat, with my mast cell reactions, with just so much. So I've also been unwell, but I haven't been able to turn my air conditioner off or I would die. So let's not do that. Um, But I've also admittedly been kind of, I guess, kind of semi-struggling with trying to figure out what things I want to cover, where I want to put my energy, where I think I can be the most useful, particularly since this isn't meant for a wide audience and it's supposed to be low energy and informal. I don't want to spend bazillions of hours into something that only a couple people are going to see, but I still want to make an impact. So trying to find that niche is pretty hard. Um, I still want to produce good quality though and good content and things that are really well thought out and that I think could make a difference in the world. So this is probably something that will be very, again, niche to a lot of people and I'm not up front convinced that it will interest too many people, but I'm going to give it a chance and see see what people think. Um, because in the recent past, of course, I disclosed my own experience with addiction, which is a very unique and uncommon story and experience. And then I also shared a bit about losing my best friend and kind of the grieving process that I'm going through with that. And then we had um, Demi Lovato being in the news and all the conversations around addiction there and celebrities, but even with Anthony Bourdain, he also had a history with drug addiction. And so that was kind of coming up and there were a lot of conversations in the public sphere about addiction. And when people would report on it, in the comments and online and on Twitter, regardless of whether or not people were supportive or sending love and affection to the person going through a hard time, a lot of conversations got spawned about addiction, who ends up addicted, why they don't stop, how they could just stop, how it's easy to get off or or, um, if you put your mind to it, basically it's in your hands and that it's a choice. And I have a bunch of feelings about that. I did an entire podcast specifically on the opioid crisis. So quote unquote opioid crisis and really addressed a lot of that. Why people find themselves using opiates, particularly heroin and why, you know, prescription medications and things like that aren't necessarily to blame and a bunch of other things. I've already talked about that. So I feel like I've, I've covered that and it was pretty insightful for a lot of people, particularly those who have never been able to understand why anyone would ever consider using something so strong like heroin, both from my experience and why I ended up there as someone who never smoked, never drank, never did a single other drug, who was very much a straight edge, intensely Christian good girl. How does one just jump straight to injecting heroin? Not just using it, but going all the way with IV drugs. And why do other people ever do it? And it's the dumbest thing and it's a choice and you know how addictive it is and things like that. So I did cover why people end up there and how how someone can make a decision that seems on the surface so stupid or so reckless to you. Um, and I would encourage you to check that one out. I don't want to repeat myself too much because that's a very nuanced conversation in and of itself. But one thing I I started to see, particularly for people who keep relapsing, which came up around Demi's situation, regardless what drug she was actually using, it just spawned conversations. And of course it, it circled a lot around heroin. And I saw a lot of people lacking sympathy for those who go to rehab and they, they, they go back, you know, like they, they can't get it together. And that they aren't then making the choice to get clean. And I think it's pretty well known in the public sphere that this is addiction. Like it's literally in the name. These people are addicted and just simply going to rehab one time is not usually going to result in, uh, in, in healing. It just, it's very uncommon. The 
rates of people returning to treatment are sky high, and that's true for all addictions, not just drug addictions. So it's not just the chemical dependency that's keeping people hooked or that their brain is altered in craving those chemicals again. It's just addiction in general. You see that even with eating disorders, which aren't classified as addictions themselves, but they have addictive properties. And other things with food and shopping and gambling and other sex and porn and exhibitionism, like lots of these things can also be addictive. Um, there's so many things. And simply just going to therapy doesn't necessarily make people just suddenly want to stop doing it or be able to stop doing it. But I feel like that is pretty well known and pretty understood. It, you don't have to educate somebody on that piece of it. You just have to say that it's an addiction, it's a, d a disease, and it's an illness, and their brain chemistry is altered and things like that. And most people will at least understand. Of course, you'll have trolls who, who disagree and are like, it's not a disease, and you know, like, that will exist. But the large public sphere at least seems to understand that part, that people are at least either physically, chemically addicted to some of these things, or just like the patterns in their brain keep them addicted. But there's so much more than that that I never, ever see people talk about. And I'm not just talking about in the general population, but I'm talking about even in circles of people who have struggled with addiction, drug addiction specifically, other people with mental health issues or other, I guess you could say addictive-ish kind of mental health issues, like things where impulsivity and obsessive kinds of qualities exist, whether eating disorder stuff like mentioned before, or even in some of the obsessive compulsive stuff, you know, like who can really understand and relate to some of that. I have to do this thing that I know won't make me well, it will actually hurt me, but I have to do it kind of thing. Like I still don't hear it ever talked about there in a lot of places. And I definitely don't see it hardly ever addressed in the trauma world, which I think is also a really it disheartens me because the largest population of drug users are childhood trauma survivors. Like, by far. Like, that is... It, it's astronomical, the overlap between drug abuse and childhood trauma survivors. So, not only does the general public not seem to know a lot about these things, but I don't see it talked about in the communities that are affected. And I have my own personal experiences with this, and I will share some of my own, but... I think it can just help you empathize more and get in the mindset of someone who's using. I think the, the stigma around what a drug user looks like is really thwarted and warped and, and, and distorted. And yes, people do fit that bill. I know lots of dirty, just awful people and they're just, they're just not good people. And they never were. Like, they just were never going to be upstanding citizens. And they take advantage of other people. And they don't put in the effort. And they're really selfish. Like, I, of course I know those kinds of people. They absolutely exist. I know a lot of abusive people that that applies to. And so when I'm trying to humanize other addicts, I'm really not. I mean, I think we should humanize those people too. There's definitely something going on there for them. But I'm Every time I try to talk about what others are going through, it's it's pretty common for someone to kind of bark back and go, well, my ex was an addict and this is what he was like, or my dad was an addict and this is what he was like, and he was just a terrible, god-awful human, and kind of then coloring all addicts under that brush. And I, I can understand that knee-jerk reaction. I had a similar feeling growing up with my dad was also an addict, and my brother experimented with a lot of drugs and made our household a living hell. So I kind of had a very negative opinion about that. And so when any time somebody would try to humanize or empathize or, or give context or give nuance, it would just make me upset. But that was a mistake on my behalf. And that subset of addicts, yeah, it exists. And yeah, it's a decent population of people. But I think think there are way more that don't fit that bill. Those are just the ones that get everyone's attention because they're assholes and they make life miserable and they're easy to point fingers at and get angry at and speak out about. It's the ones that are really nice and passive and quiet and loving. People don't usually go on Facebook rants and social media rants about that person in their life. They don't usually go, my really sweet and loving sister who just happens to be like, that just doesn't happen. They usually kind of rant about the not good ones, so you hear about them more often. But it makes people forget the vast majority of people who can find themselves with a substance abuse issue are often 
really wonderful, normal, regular, average people with nothing eventful about them. So that's kind of the people I want to talk about. But I preface with all of that to say that when I'm talking about people and I'm giving them, I don't know, a more loving, peaceful um, image, I'm also not saying that all addicts are like that either. There are awful ones out there. There are terrible ones out there. And not all of them deserve the same level of patience or sympathy or understanding or second chances or any of those things. And every person is different. Everyone's boundaries with them needs to be different. All the lines need to be different. My own best friend, who I just lost a few months ago, I love him to my core. Every time I think of him still, I get teary. Like, it's so intense how much I love him and have loved him for my whole life. But when he died in the years before, we were not happy with each other because he was not being a good person to both of us. He was a wonderful person, but somewhere in his addiction, he, he became a, started to become quote-unquote one of those, where he wasn't treating us very nicely anymore. He stopped being good to both of us and started taking more advantage and stopped thinking about others as much and kind of got into that selfish, selfish place. And so I know that even good people can have that. Like I, but deep down, most people are, they're just good people and they're really struggling with something. And usually, particularly when it comes to heroin, they're struggling with insurmountable pain, emotional or physical. Heroin specifically is not a drug for recreation. It's not fun. It's not exciting. It's an anesthetic. It kills pain. And people have to be pretty desperate to use it. And most people who use it are desperate and they're suffering and they're hurting. And it seems like the only option. So most who relapse it's because they haven't been able to kill the pain or, or treat it or find someone who can understand it or put a dent in it. Most people aren't in a place to manage that yet. They, they just got off drugs and are trying to repair relationships and all the things that their addiction caused, but they haven't had time to really soothe the emotional or physical pain that brought them there in the first place. So a lot of times people hit that wall where they're like, I'm in too much pain for this. I have to go back. Nothing else works. And I feel like that's kind of the primary thing that leads a lot of addicts to return to something as strong as heroin. But there are so many of these other little things that I don't think people realize can be going on for someone. And some of it makes somebody go back to it, whereas some of these other things keep somebody who's maybe in an addiction who wants to stop, sees the necessity to stop, or is even terrified that they might be the one person that ends up with fentanyl in their bag or something like that and wants to stop, desperately wants to stop, but can't for some of these reasons. And I want to talk about some of those. So one thing that I found that is interesting in my time as an addict and spending time with other users and talking to other people since then is how much it's how much the allure of being an IV drug user there can be, which sounds so twisted because in society or in your friends or your family or in your groups, so many people are really, really put off by needles. They're either scared of them, they gross them out, they are squeamish or it's just gross or they can't do it to themselves. I also, you know, in my time using new other people who couldn't do it for themselves, but they wanted the drug. So this doesn't apply to everybody. But more often, there is a strong subset of people who that is almost more enticing than the drug. The process of using IVs and injecting is a rush of its own. And I 100% fell into this category and met tons of other people afterward who did. And it wasn't until I brought it up to them that they felt safe enough to say it because you sound messed up when you say it at face value to say that that's alluring or enticing or exciting or cool. You sound like a sicko. But when you peel back the layers of why most of us find that so 
enticing, you can understand it a whole lot more. And I think this really piggybacks on to why trauma survivors and addicts overlap so often. So there is a sense of absolute control over one's body that you can't really get anywhere else like you can when you're self-administering an IV into your veins. And for people who have been traumatized, particularly if they've been physically or sexually abused, all of that agency and power over their body was taken away. They, it was completely obliterated and they can often feel for years and years and years like they're disconnected from their body. They don't want to be in their body. Their body is gross and even feel dysphoria over their, their different parts of themselves, you know, whether it's their actual gender or their sex organs or even just like their face and who are they and just this strong depersonalization from their body as well as just dysphoria from what their body even is or how it presents and a sense of no agency or control over what it does. When you bring in IV drugs, there's a sense that you can take that back in a way that almost nobody else can. Like nobody else can do that for you other than in the medical profession, of course, but that's not normal circumstances. This is something that you can do that not only can you do for yourself, but very, very few other people in the world can bring themselves to do. Yes, we can all put food in our mouth, and or not all, but the most of the world can feed themselves, can take care of their bodies, can clean their wounds, can dress themselves, can, you know, most of us have that ability, and there's nothing special about that. It's cool, it's great, it's necessary, it's an act of self-care, but it alone doesn't help you reclaim your body or your sense of control of your body. But something about being able to find a vein, go there, do it safely, do the proper procedure, keep it sterile, keep it as safe as can be, but literally access your bloodstream from the outside is something most people cannot do, would never do, find that repulsive to do, find that jaw-dropping and disgusting to do, but it's, it gives you a sense of agency over your body like you can't find anywhere else. It allows you to get inside your body and access your bloodstream from the outside. And that's something that a lot of people really, really struggle to let go of once they've done it. They see their body in a whole new way. They see this really complex, intricate system of veins and blood vessels and just this circuitry and how to keep them healthy and keep them strong and how to protect themselves from infection and yet they have access to this and that yet they're also administering thing, something that's inherently harmful to their body, but it's also healing their emotional pain and it's just like this the vantage point for a lot of people, it changes how they view their body. It's not just skin and bones or no longer just an object that somebody else abused, but something that they have control over and something they have a say in whether or not they have pain or they don't have pain. They specifically in the mechanics of finding a vein, accessing it, pulling back, getting blood return, and then being able to self-administer something into their body it gives a sense of agency again, and a sense of control, and a sense of power and ownership, and this really like deep, almost for some people, it's like spiritual or philosophical, or, or just like on a higher level where you feel this really intimate connection with your body, and all of its working parts and cells and the atoms and all of it, wavelength that most people don't experience, unless you have a severe chronic illness where you're doing things like. Um, port care and IV care and checking for blood return. Almost nobody else in the world is doing that to their bodies. They can't relate, they can't understand, and it gives you this one-up over what anyone else can do to you. Yes, people who abuse also do this to other people, but it's a small subset. Most people aren't going to be able to have that kind of control over your body, but you can. And most people don't even have that control over their own body, but you can have it. It just, there's this elevated sense of control and ownership and just agency again, that 
for a lot of trauma survivors is really, really, really hard to let go of, especially because most people who start didn't even realize that was going to be a thing. They didn't, they went in for the, maybe went in for the pain management side of it all and didn't know that this intense relationship was going to develop with, with this. They didn't see it coming. They didn't know that they would look at their bodies differently and look at other people, people's bodies differently and understand the vascular system differently and feel like they just can access or, or just do something that no one else can or, or, or relate to their body in a very intimate way. You also have to search your body a lot, especially the longer that you use, the fewer and fewer places you can go. So a lot of people have to get very intimate with themselves Either A, because they need to hide it we're in a place where no one else can see, so they have to choose very intimate areas, similar to the way that self-harm sometimes has to do the same thing. You have to, you know, go to very private areas that will be covered, but other times it's just out of necessity because, you know, you, you've lost a lot of veins over time, so you have to find very obscure places and really search your body. And for people who have been so depersonalized and so detached from their body, to be inspecting it with such close intensity... And sometimes even inviting other friends to do the same if they're struggling or they're, they're not um, sober enough to do it for themselves. Allowing someone else to do that can feel, it just it can feel like a re you're reclaiming your body or becoming more comfortable with it in a new way. And I definitely experienced that. And I know a lot of my friends experienced that. And we didn't realize that that would become such a strong thing. Like, I was someone who never touched anybody, never hugged anyone. If anyone sat too close to me, I would immediately hop away. I didn't touch my own body. I didn't look at it. I showered with the lights off. I wear re wore really loose fitting clothing. I didn't like anything touching me. And then when I found myself in my addiction, a lot of my body hang up started to fall away because I just developed such an intensely close relationship with it and had allowed other friends to look and help me find places to go, that my fears there started to disintegrate. And I've, I, I'm in a weird way, almost had more confidence, despite being in a worse place mentally, physically, and clearly damaging my body. And I think a lot of people find that that's true, but I hadn't had a relationship with my body for 10, 15 years beforehand. I hadn't looked at it in engaged with it, even felt like I could tolerate sitting in it, let alone getting up close and personal and exploring every last inch of it. And yet also sometimes really appreciating my body too, because I was aware that I was damaging it, yet it always healed. It always bounced back. It always worked for me. And even though I was hurting it, it would rally for me sometimes. And that's especially dramatic as a disabled person who had already by this point knew that I was medically unwell. I didn't know the extent of it, but I knew that. So to see it ever fight again or, or you know, um, just heal itself and, and work for me, even though I was working against it, made me appreciate it in such a, a unique way. Um, I had compassion for it, especially for all I was putting it through. And it, in turn, helped me have a more healthy relationship with myself now that I'm clean, it's even healthier, of course, but it kick-started something, a positive, that I never saw coming. And the idea of letting that go when it was time to quit or time to leave, no longer having that daily practice of exploring my body and looking for places to go and or keeping an eye on certain areas, that was just became such a process in my addiction that letting that go... I suddenly felt like I was neglecting my body again. Like I wasn't, I didn't have this intimate relationship with it anymore. And I wasn't allowed, I wasn't allowed in. That's what it felt like. I just wasn't allowed to my own space anymore, my own body. And it was really off-putting, so much so. And this is what I hardly ever hear anybody talk about, but it happens all the time. There are a lot of addicts, particularly IV drug users, whether it's heroin or coke or other drugs, who they might get clean and get off the substances, but they will still use syringes and IVs and just boost water. They won't put any product in it, but that personal relationship with their body is so vital, it feels so vital that they continue to do that, that they just need to 
do the process, even though they get no high from it, no benefit from it, no drugs from it. Just the process is just something that kept them in touch with themselves and they can't let it go. Um, and for others, which is why I'll move into the next category of things, a lot of it is just purely ritual. Like the whole ritual of it can be incredibly addictive. And this is especially true, again, for um, trauma survivors, whether childhood or otherwise. Many of us have PTSD. Then there are others of us who have OCD. And then others of us who have eating disorders, which are often, um, they often access a lot of the ritualized places in our mind. And so like PTSD, OCD, and um, eating disorders, particularly anorexia, often have the same issue of overplasticity in the brain and getting recycling through different sections of the brain over and over again, just on repeat. So if you're a trauma survivor, or you have other mental illnesses that come first, finding a ritual like this, the process of actually administering the drugs, it's very easy for that to become an obsession in and of itself. It can get on this cyclical loop. It's it's a ritual. It's very much like compulsion, compulsions in OCD and compulsions in eating disorders um, where you just have to do something and you have to do it in a very specific way and you feel gratified at the end of completing it even if you know that you're damaging your body in the process. It doesn't matter. It just has to happen and that feels right. And even with PTSD, the mind, even though it's less conscious, the mind will often replay memories on a cyclical level in the right order because it's trying to teach you something or remind you or something or filter through something. Even though it's hurting you, it feels like it feels right and it needs to go all the way to completion before it, it can let it go. So it's not shocking that this population really, really is attached to specifically the ritual and both the ritual of actually administering the drugs, but then also the ritual of buying them, getting them, seeing friends. Like there, there's, a, there's a process to all of these things. And for people who have a really harsh attachment to, to routine and method and ritual and compulsion, those are going to be the people who really attach strongly to this and will really struggle to let it go. So there is a large portion of people who particularly for something like heroin or an IV drug where you have to have prep. You have to, you know, get it out of the bag, put it in a spoon, get the right amount of water, stir it up. Some people heat it, some people don't. Stir it again, you know, get a cotton, suck it up, find a vein. Turn, some use a tourniquet, some don't. Find it, get it, get pulled back, get register, get some blood return, then inject. Like there are all these specific steps and a lot to make it sterile and to do it properly and a lot of drug users are actually though they're doing an irresponsible action are being as responsible about it as possible because they want to stay alive and they want to stay healthy and they don't want to infect anybody that's close to them so they they follow this proper protocol and can feel a sense of gratification by doing that feeling that they did it they did this thing they did a thing that a lot of the world is too afraid to do and they did it well and they did it without any mistakes and they did it healthfully but it was just it's just a it's just a process that is just becomes a part of your day and even if there's like no other higher gain from it it's just a ritual that you do every day and to not do it anymore can feel like just if anybody listening has OCD or has an eating disorder no like having a compulsion and not being able to do it like you know that feeling and this can be very much the same way even if you're no longer dependent on the drugs, just having it like dawn on you. But I could do that right now. I could go through that process. It just seems so alluring. Even if, again, for those who just use water and no longer use drugs, the process of it, the 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 whole, you know, setting it up, putting it on a spoon, getting cotton, and, you know, pulling it back, finding, like, that's a process. And just that alone can feel so alluring. And people just get the itch, and they're just like, I just need to do it. And it's not even about the drug. They're not even going to get high. They're not even going to use a drug. They're not going to do anything. It's just the process. And I don't even know that I can explain it to people who've never experienced it because it just sounds crazy. But so does checking in, rechecking doorknobs and, you know, counting a certain amount of things or purging after you eat. Like those things all sound bonkers to somebody who's never done it. But once you've done it, 
and all of a sudden it dawns on your mind, like, I could do that right now. Letting that thought go is really, really hard. And it's especially hard, you know, if you haven't actually gotten clean first and you're still in it and you're just thinking about leaving it. You can, you know, be maybe be sober for a couple days in a row, but then all of a sudden it dawns on you, like, oh my gosh, I haven't done my process for a while. I miss it. I'm, I, I just want to do it. And it can make a lot of people go back. Um, others, you know, might just use water or something like that, but it keeps them in that life. It keeps them in that mindset. And that's something I struggled with long after I got clean. And I wholly admit to being somebody that used water and things like that for a, a long time. And I have terrible pains <laughs> and a illness that makes them blow very, very, very easily and a whole bunch of other reasons that should make me stop. And those were all issues before I was a user, by the way. So it's not like there's a relationship there. But I had a million more reasons than most to stop, but I just couldn't. Like, it was just such a, A, a ritual, a compulsion, and this sense of control over my, not control. I don't like that word. I don't have, I don't need to have control, but agency. Like, I just... It's self-gratifying. It's not even about the control part. It's just about my body and myself and my ownership of myself that I needed. And it would often, I, I would find myself feeling the urge to use if I was more triggered in that area than a, I want to use drugs, I'm in pain kind of thing. It was more like a, if I don't feel connected to my body or I feel that somebody else is taking advantage of my body or... Um, I feel like I've lost agency over myself somewhere else, even in a medical setting. Like having other people poke and prod at me, you know, I can often come home and that, that would be what would trigger me to want to use or to go through the process again, just to feel some sense of ownership of myself again. That I get to say how we do this, the way we do it, the angle that we do it at, which veins we use, that I get to access my insides and no one else does. Like it's those would those would be my kinds of triggers more than just a, I want to use drugs. And I found that to be the case with a lot of my friends and a lot of other trauma survivors that I've met in trauma treatment, not necessarily drug treatment, because most of us should just be in trauma treatment, not, not drug rehab. But that's where that kind of stuff would really come out. And I know a lot of other people that would just be in kind of traditional drug rehab often miss these big things because they're just so focused on the what does the substances give you what are why are you addicted to it how does it make you feel the high all that stuff and kind of miss all of these deeper deeper layers and ones that lots of people relate to and so I guess the other thing that like I've mentioned in there that there's a theme in it that for some it applies for some it doesn't I think IV drug use especially and something as strong as heroin can make a certain subset of people feel powerful all of a sudden. Yes, you're hurting your body in one of the most damaging ways that you ever can. You're facing death literally every single time you inject and are doing something that puts you in society's eyes at the bottom of the barrel, the lowest of the totem pole. Yet you can still feel a sense of power in a way that you never did before. Because that can sometimes come with a sense of invincibility and just pridefulness. Like, all of these things can kind of come together in varying degrees for some, a cluster for others. Some just have, like, one quality of it, but none of the others. But there can be a big... Ego trip sounds wrong, but just um, a, almost like a self-esteem building thing. Where doing the one thing that the rest of the world seems like it's impossible or it's something they could never ever do or they get squeamish or uncomfortable like knowing that you can do the one thing that no one else will do can give you this sense of I guess for some it's power for some it's a an inflated ego for some it's just boosting an ego that they never had like it's giving them one thing like well at least I can do this and at least I'm good at this and man I can do this thing that if I even joke about it with my friends they look shocked and horrified like that's a they can't even fathom doing something that that terrifying or scary or overwhelming and or even other drug users that's often the line they hit where they're like well I'll do all that but I would never use heroin or I'll do any I'll experiment with any other drug but I'll never 
boost them. I'll never, I'll never do IV drugs. And so if you hear that often enough and you're one of those who, who does that thing, it can give you this sense of accomplishment and you're just unique or that you're special or that you're a little more powerful than others or you have a quality that other people don't have. And for most people who are using, they have no self-esteem. They've maybe been traumatized and beaten to the ground for forever or they're just in so much agony and pain and in other areas of their life feel like they have no willpower or um, merit you know, in their life. But this is the one thing that kind of can give that, where it's just you can feel powerful um, and skilled and unique and like you've got a talent or like you've just got this thing that no one does. It's almost enigmatic. Like it's, and that's a big deal for broken, broken people who have nothing else to restore their sense of confidence or any of that. And letting that go can be really, really, really hard. And you can develop a bit of an identity even amongst your friend group and even amongst other people who use drugs recreationally because that disparity is often made where it's like, well, these are fun and recreational, but those are serious and hardcore and really dangerous and whatever. So if you fall into that other category, you can kind of get this identity of I'm the risk taker. I'm the one who's not afraid of danger. I'm the one who's not afraid to die. I'm brave. I'm courageous. Like, and these are all not true. These are all diluted. They're not honest, but it can get inside your head and feel that way. And to, let go of that can feel like you just come crashing back down to reality to the, oh no, I'm just a reject. My whole life is a mess. I've got no skills, no talent. My relationships are struggling. Yeah, I've got a nice house and a nice car and maybe a great job, but they're all kind of struggling too. And like, it just can bring you back down. And you're like, but in this area, in this community, amongst my friends, I'm doing something really fucking cool. Which, again, it's not cool. This is not... Don't do this. This is terrible. Like, I do not advocate... This is a life ruiner. I've lost so many friends. Like, this is not a promotion. This is me clearly just demonstrating the mindset of a drug user. One that is unhealthy. It is toxic. It's not real. It's not based in reality. But that's how it can feel. And so that's why, A, it's a mental illness, because we're clearly not thinking very clearly. But how it can be so hard to leave, or why so many return when it is so reckless and so inane and just has no way of not destroying your life. In the moment, these are the qualities, though, that make people feel like it's worth it or it's worth that. Like, oh, well, who cares if the rest of my life is destroyed or I risk death? I've got these few things that that are at least scratching an itch or healing an old wound or even making or addressing things of my past. Um, So there's that. And I feel like in that it should be kind of almost inevitable that of course a huge part of that is just that there's a huge thrill and adrenaline rush that can come from that which sounds counterintuitive that someone who would be using opiates which are sedating and can make most people just kind of fall out or not out um please don't fall out no no um But yeah, not out. And to think of them as people who would be seeking thrill or adventure, it seems like they shouldn't go together. But it's kind of a way to get both. It it is thrilling. It is and completely independent of the euphoria of the drug. Take the substance out of it. Just the process of doing it can be a thrill and an adventure. But not just the actual injecting of the drugs but obtaining them and sometimes obtaining the money to get them like that in itself, it's illegal. It takes this cunning, creative skill that a lot of people don't have. We're not taught it anywhere. And so if you can find a way to navigate this system safely and effectively and get real creative, and a lot of people have to lie to family or friends, which again, not a good thing. Don't ever do it. But every time you succeed in one of them, especially if you got really creative or really convincing, it can be a thrill and it can be another ego boost. And you can feel like you've got a skill that you didn't even know you had. And again, for really broken people who are 
have no esteem, any little tiny factor like that can feel like a big deal. Again, disclaimer, there are other places in life where you can get the same exact feeling for a whole lot better in a much more meaningful way. But in that moment, for those people, that can feel like a big deal. And it can feel like that's the only place in their life that they're getting that feeling, which is sad. But it's true. And it's a rush. And letting that go can feel like life is just very mundane and very boring. And you've got no skills or talents or or things. In reality, you could use all those skills for something else. But when you're first letting it go, you can't imagine how that would translate. In that moment, it feels like it only applies to this world. But, you know, after a lot of healing and recovery, you can certainly realize, like, no, I was super creative. I was actually really ballsy. I was willing to make questionable decisions when I thought that it was for the better, which can be really helpful, especially if you're, like, wanting to go into an area of seeking justice or challenging corrupt power forces or whatever. Sometimes you you can't just tow the legal line all of the time because that's not how you break some of those things down. So if you're a bit of a risk taker and, like, a... I'm willing to bend the rules because it's for the greater good. That's a quality that some people don't have. They're just a to the T kind of person. So there are places that these skills can be applicable outside of the drug world. But when that's all you've known and those are the first times that you ever realized that you even had those skills, it can feel like that's the only place they're good for. That's the only, this is the, this is your calling almost. Like this is the one thing I'm good at and I'm really good at it. I can't translate that anywhere outside of my life that isn't illegal or immoral. And so I should just stay and do this. And that's sad. It's very sad. But it makes perfect sense why a lot of people don't want to let that go. Um, And I feel like a little bit from that, I feel like when it comes to using drugs or staying with them, It can be one of two sides. It can either be like a self-fulfilling prophecy or a self-rejecting one. So for those who have been told all of their life that they're just a reject, a loser, they're just immoral, they're bad, they're... uh, I don't know, all of these things that society thinks are bad and that are negative and that have been used against them. A lot of people can kind of just, if they've heard it all of their life, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy where it's just like, yeah, you're right, I totally am. I'm all of those things. And... I have no incentive to change, and now that I'm a user, no one will take me seriously. I'm always just going to be a junkie in their eyes. I'm not going to be able to get work, and if that's all I am now, and that's all how anybody will ever see me, well, then this is just what I'm going to be. I, I, Why should I be anything else? Because that's not only harder, it requires recovery. I won't be able to get the pain relief that I need, and... So why don't I just do this? Who even cares? This is who I am. You've told me this is who I am, and so I'm just going to be that thing. And considering a different way is foreign. And I see that probably more than than most things, especially after someone has been an addict for a while, or if they've relapsed a few times. To them, it can almost get harder each time because it's like, I identify myself as an addict, but the whole world identifies me as that now, as well as everybody who's close to me. I don't know how to break out of that because I don't even know who I am outside of that, but the outside world doesn't know who I am either. This is all they know me as, and I'm too tired to carve a new path for myself. If everyone else is going to see me as an addict and that's all I know myself to be, what do I even do? So I'm just going to stay in this world because I don't. I feel like an alien. I feel like a fish out of water anywhere else, and I don't. I don't know how to be anything but this, and this feels familiar to me. Um, But then there are others who it's rejecting that, either rejecting who they were before or who other people told them that they were. Um, Like for me, I, again, was a great, great kid, super straight edge, super straight A's, everything about me was faith-based and I was a rule follower and like obnoxious, like the kind of person that you, that gets on your nerves because they are so to the T, good kid, overachiever, that kind of thing. And 
I was always told also because I had, you know, siblings that were troubling um, and made our lives difficult. But A, if I was ever anything like them, that I'd just be like kicked out from minute one, but always celebrated for being nothing like them. And initially I took a lot of pride in that, but over time, I don't know, I got angry at that idea and I hated that everyone saw me that way because as I tried to come into my own and A, realizing that I was a queer person, realizing that I was a trauma survivor, realizing that I'm actually a very artsy kind of punk rock person, but had been conditioned to be Argyle sweatshirts and bows in my hair, like just by trying to make a few physical changes that were a little bit that showed my more alternative side that I've always been and that I was even as a really really little kid but then got conditioned into being this very very good Christian girl when I tried to just express myself a little bit more freely whether it's with my hair or with piercings or with clothes and I didn't go crazy it was I just dipped my toe into the water I got such harsh feedback that it rubbed me wrong. I was just trying to experiment a bit and dip my toe in the water. I didn't do an about face, but everyone's reaction to it was so dramatic that then then I got upset. Then I got upset that I was pushed into such a rigid mold that I couldn't even explore a little bit outside of it without everyone freaking out. So I was like, you know what? If If you can't even accept me trying to get to a more authentic version of myself, then who the hell even is that person? And that person that I was before was clearly crafted by all of these people around me because it never felt true to me. That's not who I am. And now that I see everyone's reaction to me trying to deviate from that, I realize that that person is someone, A, I don't know, and B, that you created. And now I don't want anything to do with her because that's not me. That's based on you. And you, as the outsiders, are terrible, abusive people. So I want to be nothing like her. And... I didn't have like a an act of rebellion. Like it wasn't like that was what where that was coming from. I wasn't that's not why I was a, a drug user. I that was a totally different scenario, but after I wanted to try to get clean and whatnot, I almost felt like I identified with that kind of person more where cuz everyone sees users as kind of dr- as grungy and just irresponsible and reckless and all of these things, and there's an element of that. I feel like all of my drug using, for the most part, and all of my friends was very mundane and very boring and very suburbia, for the most part. Yeah, we spent some time in a few cities, but compared to what you think of, it's very boring. But the outside perception of me was as if I was, I don't know, doing something wild and risky and... I don't know, dramatic, like you would catch on TV. And so leaving that world, that taste of some adventure, that taste of something different, or this outside perception of me, I'm like, I don't want to leave it. I would rather you just think I'm a total asshole and a reject and a whatever, because it's better than what you've always thought of me before. This is, I am also not those things either, a reject and on all those things. I'm not actually a bad person But at this point, I would almost rather you think that of me than the bullshit you were thinking of me before. So that's at least more entertaining to me and is at least more colorful and exciting and different. And go ahead. I'd rather you just think of me as that than as the girl who got sober and cleaned up and got her act together. Like, that feels started to feel too close to the old me, the molded fake me. And I didn't like that idea. I didn't want to become, quote-unquote, the good kid again. And even though this was the only thing I was doing, quote-unquote, wrong, I didn't want to be seen that way by other people just because I, that had rubbed me so wrong. So it was like a self-rejecting prophecy there, too. Where it was like, you, you made me be this one thing, and now I just don't want to be seen as anything else. I want to... I, and I hadn't figured out my identity, either. So I feel like a lot of people can fall into both of that, where it's just self-fulfilling of what others have taught them and what they've believed about themselves are just railing so hard against a former you that ever having to do take any steps that would get you kind of even sort of back to that can just feel so wrong and discordant and like no 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 no. I I don't want that I uh -uh. I I feel more at home here in this different world and yeah 
I feel like the next big thing in that, though, in, in terms of feeling at home, the one of the biggest things that I feel keeps people using, even if they want to stop or even if they've stopped for a while, is really just friends and community. I think that's above all of these other things, but this is one I feel like it is talked about a lot and people do understand in public conversation. So this is nothing new, but I feel like the way it's described is a little bit um, bland. I mean, of course, when you are using, you have friends who use, you hang out with them. And I think the more that recovery programs are more popularized, a lot of us are aware that it's highly recommended that if you get clean, you leave the people and friendships that you had or anybody else who was using. You usually, they recommend that you don't interact with them for a very, very long time. I think a lot of them even go so far as to say don't ever, which is too black and white. And it's just, it's a well-known thing that a lot of times programs or therapists will ask you to leave anybody that you've ever known that's used. And maybe one day you could get back to talking to them, but not anytime soon. And even if you, like most people require some level of help to get clean, either a program or a therapist or something. Most people can't do it on their own. And they don't want to go to someone who's going to insist that they leave all of their friends. And it's insanely hard. Most of my friends that used were also wonderful people. They were good people. They were respectable. And there were some there were some rough ones in there. And I was fine to let them go. In fact, most of, a lot of the reason I wanted to stop using was just so that I could just get out of that part of the world. Get, a, get away from those people. But most anybody, and I found this, again, to be true for a lot of other people that I know, they, their friends were actually really great. Really great people. And really there for them. And... It was going to be hard regardless whether some told them, someone told them to leave those people or not. To not use when all of your friends are using is just hard. Um, it's really hard to keep your resolve. So even if you know you just tried to keep them anyway, that was going to be an added challenge. But trying to get help and go to counseling and have someone tell you that you have to just you know leave them or set really firm boundaries or never see them again is crushing. And it's lonely and it's devastating and it's a greater loss than the drug or your old sense of self or your old identity. It's just all of these people that how can you just up and leave them one day? And yeah, there could be gray area and you could do both, but I think a lot of people realize pretty quickly that it's too hard to do both, that that's why it's a good recommendation, that it is often too hard to to hang around the same people and places and not feel urges all of the time to use. So, you know, whether it's directed by someone else or they just find it out organically on their own that staying around their friends and in those same places is too risky for them, you have to leave them and put up walls and boundaries and distance between people you really, really, really care about. And that's just hard regardless. I mean, anybody listening, even if you've never done a drug, just imagine if someone told you you have, you can't, talk to your four closest friends for at least a few years like you and or that you realize that every time you're around them that it's hurting you like just imagine if one day you realize that and just had to leave them and and maintain that and try to do it without hurting their feelings and it's brutal and yet it's what a lot of addicts truly need um and it's so soul crushing. I know every time I thought about it, I would always be around the people that I care about and being like, I don't know how I could ever, how could I leave them? How, how could I even distance myself a bit to get clean? Or how could I maintain a relationship when I know that, that like I, it was, I could not wrap my mind around it. And in the following years, it's something I've really struggled with ever since I've been clean for eight years now. And ever since I left that friend group, I've not found a new one. Like, they were lifelong friends for me, but I had to step away. And it's been years, and I've still not found a new core group of people, because I had to leave the ones who meant everything to me. 
and I and I did need to. It was valid. But it's heartbreaking and a lot of people just that's harder than losing the drugs. So they just stay and do it. I also found that there were times and I had, luckily I had good friends. So even if I had wanted to clean up and they weren't ready, they were never going to pressure me or ask me or they would even help me. Like if there were many times that I tried and would be clean for a couple weeks at a time. And if I went to visit and they were using or they were thinking about it, they would either be like, hey, I'm thinking of doing that today. Let's maybe not hang out today. Or, hey, I'm going to do this. I want to do it outside or I'm going to go away from you. You want to go take off and do something else for a little bit and come back? Like anything to make it a little bit easier on me so that I wasn't, so that I could stay clean. Or that even if I asked them, you know, like, hey, can you get me this thing? I decided that I'm not going to try to stay clean anymore. They would be the support system that would be like, do you really want to do that, Kay? Like, it's, let, let's not. Let, give it one more day. See how you feel tomorrow. Like, they would, so I had good friends who, if I really wanted to stay clean, I could have. Um, I did prove too hard for me, but they wouldn't have been the reason for it. Like, like anything they did wouldn't have been the reason for it. Being around them and in that environment just kept triggering me. But they, as people, would have been the most helpful and supportive to make it the, as possible for me as they could. Um, and that's not true for everybody. Um, but so I even had good friends to help. But I found a lot that if I wanted to stop, I I no longer had an excuse to hang out with people. And I didn't need that with my good friends, but after having that relationship long enough, it started to feel like it was kind of inevitable, or I just needed that to be my reason to come on over, or at least part of it, and just dropping by, especially if we weren't going to use, just made me suddenly feel very uncomfortable, or or even like I was afraid they were going to just think I was there to, to use, or like, I don't know, like, there's just a lot of head games that go through your mind, and, um... But more than anything, I would be clean for a while and find myself at home by myself for a couple days and realized how much of a part of my daily routine that was. To get out, to get up, get dressed, put clothes on, go outside, go get what I need to, and then hang out with people all day. Like, it was a very social thing. It made me get dressed, get clean, go outside my house. And when I wasn't using, I was just at home and bored and no one to talk to and no reason to get clean or take a shower or go outside and... I would find that I just wanted to see somebody. I just wanted to talk to somebody. I wanted to meet with people. I wanted to have a reason to take a shower and go see someone. And it felt like the only way to do that was to be like, yeah, sure, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll use today. Like, uh, it felt like that would be like the only way to do that and so I would just end up calling up people and be like hey let's do that or let's go get some or whatever just because it was a routine it was something to do it was long car rides with friends and music and sitting there waiting for whatever and singing silly songs and you know just enjoying each other's company all be you know as a as a part of you know trying to to score and then to use but I didn't know anything different, so the idea of just calling up one of my friends to be like, hey, let's go do that, let's just go go for a drive and go, like, you could do the same exact thing, just minus the drugs part, but it suddenly felt like I didn't know how to do that anymore, like, and I'm socially awkward, and I, you know, whatever, like, it felt easier to do if we're, if we both understood why we were doing it, and that we were just throwing all these cool fun things, like music, and stopping at restaurants, and doing cool just as a way to kill time or just part of this other main objective. Somehow it felt like safer to do it that way. Whereas if I was just like, no, but I just want to hang out with you and do all those cool things just by themselves. Like not because we're trying to kill time or because we're, it's an aside to our main objective. Something that felt too threatening and too vulnerable and too much. Like I want to be your friend. Like it, like like it had too much substance. Like it's one thing if we're like, we're just here for business. We're just doing this thing. We're just getting what we want and then we're going to use and whatever. And if we do all this really cool, frolicky, fun, cool, loving, meaningful life, friend stuff on the side, well, that's just on the side. <laughs> but trying to ask someone to be like, hey, you want to do all that cool, like, life-affirming stuff, like, as friends, just because, with no other main objective, like, somehow that felt threatening and weird and, like, too much, and it was too much affection and whatever, like, I just needed a, 
a focus. Then it was loud. If we had this very direct focus, well, then we could throw anything else on top and have a good time and it would feel great. Like, I don't know, but I think a lot of people experience that. Again, especially people who have other mental illnesses, struggle with social interaction, or again, uh, I will repeat it until ad nauseum, that trauma survivors who just don't have... They, they haven't had proper healthy relationships and attachments and a lot of their attachments are disorganized. And so it's not surprising that they find some level of comfort in like relating to friends and people that way where it's a, uh, we're like connecting and attached, but not really like we've got like, it's a, it's a very conditional kind of thing. And it, that it feels safer that way. Or if it's just this very unboundaried, unfiltered, unfocused relationship, suddenly it feels very threatening where it's like, we can't just be friends. There's no limit to that. There's no bounds to that. But if I have this like straight line path of, but we're just getting drugs and we're going through the process and we have to be here at this time and meet this person and text, whatever, like having something, a friendship that kind of fills out around it, that can feel safe because we've got like a sturdy line, but just friendship in general on itself with no objective, no goal, no, no destination it's just such a strange concept. It's like, I don't know what this is. So I can't have that. I can't have it with my old friends. I can't have it with any new friends I meet. That seems too scary and threatening and um, chaotic. So I'm just going to do the thing that I know. I'm going to talk to and have relationships with the people that I know who are involved in my using, and they're going to help me facilitate it. But then we're going to get all that really cool, meaningful friendship connection stuff on the, on the side. And Again, I don't hear anybody explain things like this, and yet I feel like there are so many people I talk to, most have relate, they relate to some of this somewhere. But it's so rigid in the way that people view addiction and just the community, especially when you get into like 12 step programs and stuff, they all address it from a very methodic way and approach recovery in a very methodic way. There are all these really intense nuances of what really keeps people addicted. Especially, it's very, in my mind, very similar to eating disorders in that it's not really about the food. Yes, the food is the vice that we're using to manipulate all of this stuff, to manipulate our mind and our bodies. Like, that's, that's, that's the tool that we're using. But all the reasons why we're using that tool and how we're attached to it and why we're afraid to leave it, that's where the actual disorder is. It has nothing to do with the foods itself or even the weights itself. Like those are just the input output, the mechanics of it all. But the why someone is doing the things that they're doing, what kind of distorted thoughts are going through their mind or weird appeals and allures to it. Like all that stuff, like all the, all the mind stuff is where the actual addiction lies. And so it's no different to me in substance abuse addiction. It's not really necessarily always about the actual drug, what it is, how it makes you feel, the euphoria or like actual like chemical effects to your brain. Yes, that matters there too, of course. But it's less of that stuff than all this other stuff. That's the stuff that keeps people constantly coming back and why they went to it in the first place. And especially for something like heroin where it's so risky and so dangerous and seems so insane. Like just simply saying, oh, I had a lot of emotional pain and or I was in a lot of physical pain. I just want something to heal it. And then I got so addicted to the way that it made me feel. That is way too one dimensional and Yet that's where a lot of treatment and conversations about addiction stay. They might get a little more nuanced than that, but it mostly stays on that platform. All of these other things that I've mentioned about, especially like a bodily autonomy and agency and really connecting and having a meaningful relationship with your body and being in your personhood and learning to appreciate and explore and feel control over your body and being able to access a part of you that no one else can reach. No one. No one else can just get into your veins, but you can. Like, those kinds of things. And the sense of power or the sense of invincibility that you can do this really scary thing that no one else can do. Or you're doing a really dangerous thing and living through it against all odds. Like this this rush that comes from there. The thrill and the adrenaline of making a sale, contacting people, breaking the law, sometimes doing nefarious things to get money or scheming or 
the 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 rush and the focus and the planning and the creativity and all of that just adrenaline rush and just like the addictive properties of something so exciting or you know fulfilling messages about themselves or becoming a different person or an identity and who they are and what being an addict says about them or what being a drug user rather says about them like all of those things like there are just so many intricate details and I missed a bazillion more I wouldn't miss them I just decided not to include a lot of them but there are so many things that lead people to certain drugs keep them in them long after they would like to stop and keep them coming back and yet no one ever talks about most of this it's not just the drug that kept them back or how it makes them feel or oh I want to feel that high again I want to feel that substance again I mean that's there too but it's a lot of these other things that are oftentimes more intense and more of a a draw or more of a complicated relationship where there's a lot of push and pull or you know one time they relapse for this other reason because they were triggered like you know if they needed a sense of bodily autonomy again or they you know felt violated and needed a sense of control like maybe that's what led them to relapse one time whereas maybe another time it was just feeling really low about themselves like they have no skill sets or no talents or no whatever and suddenly they're just like but this is the one thing I'm good at like that could be a reason for another relapse you know like there's lots of lots of things and each time they may fall for a different reason entirely but it's not always just a oh I was craving drugs and that made me feel really good and I can't resist that urge let me go do it I know that that happens too I I, pro- I promise that it does and I and I often think of those things but I often sometimes in my mind will think, well, I was just thinking about how that drug made me feel and I could smell it and taste it and feel it in my mind and it was such an intense memory that all I wanted was to feel it again. But typically, if I actually were to backtrack further, like that's what it seemed like made me feel so like I wanted it. But I bet if most of the time, if I step back even before that, why did I even think about that drug? What even made me go there? Usually it was one of these other things first that popped into my head and I could draw back on my mind of like, when's the one time I felt like I had that itch scratched? When did when did that feel good? Oh, that was when I was using. That's when I was hanging out with these people. That's when I was in these places doing this stuff. And then I started fantasizing about the drug and how it made me feel. Usually I, it, unless I saw something like on TV or people were specifically talking about using drugs and I saw the actual thing, like unless that happened, It was hardly ever actually about the drug and how it made me feel. Something else led me to that. And I think that's true for a lot of people. Usually we're struggling with something else entirely. And eventually, in our mind, we lead to remembering how the drug made us feel. And just thinking, oh, that's what I want. I want the drug. Let me go get it. And so then a lot of therapy and rehab and conversations online and stuff like that start about that like where it's like well if you just want to if you just want to use and you're just you know got the itch or you're just jonesing for a fix well you still have a choice you shouldn't have done that you just shouldn't have wanted the drug and it's yeah we can always make better decisions but it's not like where it started something else was going on for them first and then eventually they started jonesing for the drugs and you can't You've got to fix that other stuff or people are going to stay addicted. They're going to still find themselves struggling. And that's the bigger issue. And I don't like where a lot of the conversations online go, where it's put out there as if it's just a dependency on a substance or everyone just wants to get high or they just like a euphoria or they just want to escape all their problems. All of that stuff matters too. And it's relevant and it exists. But that's really, really breaking it down to this very one-dimensional, just incomplete view of of all of it. Um, But I feel like it's not just the general public. Addicts can forget that. They can hear it so much and just think it's all about those kind that that very cut and dry obsession and addiction to a drug. When in reality. It's a lot of addiction and attachment and relationships to a whole, to everything else. Everything else. Anything but that drug, even. That usually keeps a lot of people down and makes recovery really hard and makes rehab sometimes fail. Because they can feel like they're doing all the right things. 
they might be making the choice every time to avoid the drug, but constantly keep struggling and don't know why. They're like, but I'm doing all the right things. I'm making the right choices. I'm because it's this stuff. This is what their actual addiction is. This is where they're so attached to it. These other qualities that I mentioned here are what's fueling their addictive and intrusive thoughts, not their obsession with the drug. It's other stuff. So, <laughs> as per usual, I talked forever, but I don't know. I know that these longer ones don't garner that much attention, but it's not about that. If I can just educate one person or make them think about addiction, substance abuse, eating disorders, even compulsions, any of these things in a more understanding way, it's a win for me. I, I really feel strongly about this and feel like it was appropriate for this podcast because a lot of chronic illness suffer sufferers haven't had their pain properly managed and that's one big contributing factor for them finding themselves using street drugs. A lot of just people with general mental illness often can struggle with this because they have vulnerability factors that make them become addicted more than regard whatever the drug is, like aside physical addiction. And then, of course... The biggest deal is that most addicts are not, well, not, I don't, I wish I could remember the exact statistic, but a ton of addicts are childhood trauma survivors, and they're the ones that come with a lot of this other baggage, and that's why they're addicted to a lot of these things. That's what fuels their substance abuse, not, not an addiction to a drug, but a complex relationship with all of these other topics, and the drug is just the the medium to, to accomplish it, um, to meet those needs. And if you're always leaving those details out, you're going to fail the, the addict. You're going to let them down. They're not going to get the healing that they need. And hopefully we can help them. We can help each other and help one another understand that it's so much more complex than all of that. Okay. I am sure I will talk to you soon, and I hope that all of you are hanging in there. Um, just again, as an uplifting note at the end, I am eight years clean. I haven't thought about using in a very long time, um, but I'm okay. And I actually, compared to most, had a very quote-unquote easy recovery, but it was because I was aware of all of these things, and I was processing them in trauma therapy right away. I spent almost zero time on what the drug itself was doing or my addiction to a drug. I was talking about all of these other things. I was in an addiction and a complex relationship to everything else that surrounded the drug. Yeah, the drug also killed a lot of my pain and, and got me through, but it was everything else. And so I had a very easy time getting well. And I cannot say the same for about any of my other friends and obviously lost someone very, very important to me because they weren't able to tackle all of their reasons either. Um, but it's possible. I'm a living testament to that and I feel incredibly stable and solid and is why I feel safe enough to talk so openly about this and I hope that others can, can feel that and to take some benefit from it and ultimately also feel a sense of hope that it is absolutely possible to get clean and to feel secure in that and to not always feel like you're in a fragile state of recovery. I feel both this way about this as well as my eating disorder history. I feel like once I tackled a lot of these things that kept me hooked, both issues radically healed and very quickly. And if I can help even one person start that journey for themselves, then an hour and 20 minute long podcast that six people listen to is totally worth it. <laughs> okay. I hope all of you find yourselves doing pretty well, as well as can be. I always hope for even better. And I'm sure I will talk to you very soon. Okay. Bye.